This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. This podcast is sponsored by The Forward. Stay up to date with unlimited access to news, culture, and opinion all through a Jewish lens. And for our listeners, for 2NJB listeners, get six months of The Forward for 15 bucks. Visit forward.com slash partner offer and enter promo code 2NJB to get an exclusive offer for podcast listeners. Also in collaboration with Arutz Sheva, IsraelNationalNews.com. And last but not least, in collaboration with Australian Jewish News, check them out at ajn.timesofisrael.com. It seems like forever ago, when rockets hit Israel and we ran to shelters to the soothing sounds of sirens. Actually, wait. That was a week ago. That's the pace of things in the Middle East. Still, though, something big happened here. Tectonic changes. Things will never quite be the same as they were. Many people blame the recent round of hostilities on Jerusalem-related events, be it the Temple Mount where we made the Palestinians angry, or Sheikh Jarrah where apparently we made the Palestinians angry. They get angry quite often, I've noticed. But I digress. In the aftermath of Operation Guardian of the Walls, we decided to summon some of our favorite past guests to talk about what went down and the current situation. Ophir Dayan is a Temple Mount enthusiast, an Al-Aqsa aficionado, (laughs) if you will, and an advocate for Israel in the world. As a student at Columbia University in New York, she served as the head of SSI Students Supporting Israel. And our second guest tonight, Jonathan El Khouri was one of our first guests on the podcast back in 2001. Today marks his third. 2001. 2001 is what's written here, and that's what I'm sticking (laughs) to. Okay? (laughs) When was it? Back in... 14? 15? 17. 17? 2017. You wrote 2000. Ah, I, I, Never know, I know what it is. Yeah. It's it 2001, a Lebanese yeah. uh, Odyssey. Odyssey. Yeah. Continue. That's how it happened. <laughs> Continue. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Um, so check out the episode, guys. It's episode 21. Today marks his third time on our show. We're super thrilled to have Jonathan and Ophir uh, today to try and understand what the hell happened here and what the future holds for Israel and for Jerusalem. Thank you guys so much for joining. Before we start, yeah, of course, we have sponsors. Yes, Before he always we do. forgets. I never forget. I don't know what you're talking about. If you're listening, guys, though, you probably have some interest in Israel, okay? And we have to tell you about Masa Israel Journey because this is an amazing opportunity. Masa Israel Journey is the marketplace for long-term opportunities in Israel, where you can explore your career path, you can live out your passions, and you can make a positive impact on the world. I was on a Masa program. It's a, a big part of the reason that I'm here today. And during the pandemic, Masai actually created options to study and work remotely from Israel. Uh, You don't need to pause your life or know Hebrew, but you do get funding. So check them out. MasaiIsrael.org slash TWO Nice Jewish Boys. MasaiIsrael.org slash Two Nice Jewish Boys. And of course, this episode is sponsored by the Susie and Kevin Davis Foundation, which supports New York City's underserved community through its nonprofit First Workings. First Workings is actually amazing, just as Kevin and Susie themselves are. First Workings arranges paid internships, mentorships, and extensive workplace uh, readiness training for very bright students from New York's public schools. Okay, so they get these uh, underprivileged New York inner city kids, and they send them to these amazing opportunities to get them ready for the workplace. It's really an amazing thing. Please check them out at firstworkings.org and consider supporting their efforts Guys, thank you so much for joining. Hi. Yeah. Thank so, you for having us again. So what 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 third, the hell? Third time, right? Third time, for yeah. both of us. Yeah. Third time for both of you? Yes. Ah, sorry, oh. Ophir. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> we thought it's this your second time, but <laughs> that's a special edition. Can't believe you don't remember that. I was Three here to times. talk about SSI and then we did BLMing the Jews and now uh, it's uh, right. third time. You're right. Ooh, you're that's right. That's true. Okay, so first of all, guys, check out episode I think it was two oh eight. 
I don't know. How am I bringing this stuff out? No, because no, I just checked it. <laughs> Episode 208, BLMing the, the Jews. Right. And uh, and the other one, I don't know. Uh, me neither. The other one, I don't know. It was a long so, time ago. Okay, can we talk about how crazy it is that really a week ago, we were at war. We were all in bomb shelters. I slept three nights in a bomb shelter. Our, wi- our bomb shelter window is still closed because I was like way too lazy to open it up. And today... You go out in the streets in Tel Aviv. I'm going out to a restaurant tonight. You guys are going out to a restaurant tonight. Like, what the hell is going on? It's a very good question, I think. What's going on is is Israel. I mean, um, I I don't remember who said that on Twitter, but one of the reporters said that, you know, the last month produced um, like two years worth of news in one week, um, which is kind of insane. But I kind of feel like it's very typical of Israel. I feel like even on campus, when I had to explain what's going on in Israel, like so many, when someone's asking me, like, what's the deal with Israel? What's happening now in Israel? Like, I can never explain it because there's so many things happening at once that you can never, like, simply explain in one sentence what's going on currently in Israel. Even even during the operation, we right. had so many front lines that, you know, suddenly they started shooting rockets from Lebanon. Suddenly, you know, we had the things, the internal things in Israel going on. We had Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem. So everything together kind of mixed and people didn't really follow up. And I think this is one of our huge problems that, you know, people all the time looking to just, you know, publish stuff about Israel. Yeah. And forget to to take the time and try to like direct each of one of these problems differently because then but they things a, happen. Was, I have to mention there was yeah. a suicide bombing in uh, in Afghanistan where like ninety three people died during the war. Uh, that, it's that Arabs killing here. Arabs, and no one talked about it. Most of them were women and children. No, no one talked about it. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. in a school, I think. Right? Yeah, in a school. Not to mention the hijacking of a plane in uh, in Serbia, in in, uh, in Belarus. In Belarus, Belarus. that's yeah. insane. Yeah, well, I I think if we go back to what we talked about earlier, I think. It's really interesting because people ask, you know, what's happening with Israel, but they don't even like notice subtleties of we're talking about what Israel does and then what the Palestinians are doing. But this entire conflict started because there is no one what the Palestinians are doing. Um, It all started in a lot of it because the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, decided to postpone the elections once again. And Hamas were... um, I think justifiably kind of certain that they're going to win the election uh, in Judea and Samaria. Um, Nobody's talking about it. No. Nobody's talking about it. And and they're looking at, you know, the poor Palestinians, but they're not realizing what's actually happening on the ground. There's two Palestinian nations. Um, it's not one Palestinian nation, you know, with a clear agenda. If you ask someone who supports um, Abu Mazen, and the Palestinian Authority, what they think, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be completely different and they are going to have different interests than people in Hamas um, and Hamas in Gaza. There's not I'm not any. sure how many Abu Mazen supporters, Mahmoud Abbas supporters are there. I mean, those are um, on the payroll. I think that's yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> What's amazing to me is that they, uh, the, 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 like, the one of the excuses for the reason things broke out is that Bibi is a warmonger and that he brought this. And you have literally a guy who went to elections like four times, five times, and got ridiculous, overwhelming support. And then you have a guy on the other side who's literally a dictator. And people are like, no, nah, it's his fault. He's the one who, who, like, you know, manipulated. And it's just, it's unbelievable. Jonathan, have you been uh, following the Arab world during the operation? Yeah, I have. I, I've, um, I, I really wanted to find some, you know, news from the UAE, from our newest allies. And I saw some some conflicted opinions about it because a lot of people didn't really know what happened. So when it was only about uh, uh, the Temple Mount, Al-Aqsa and Jerusalem, their, you know, them being Muslim, they were really concerned on what is going on. Uh, um, on the Temple Mount. But suddenly when the operation with Gaza started, there was like almost 95% of the voices from the UAE were like, okay, Hamas is a terrorist organization. This is something that is really well known. And, you know, they, they kind of stood beside Israel saying that Israel has its right to defend itself against terrorist organizations. And um, I don't know who followed, you know, if you followed or, or saw the statement by the UAE government, they have... They didn't even say one word against Israel. And this is like the first time that something like that happens. And I think this is a huge step that we are doing 
with with major Arab world countries. We have to give context a bit to our <coughs> listeners uh, because not everybody listened to our past episodes with Jonathan, but Jonathan is actually the son of a uh, southern Lebanese uh, army uh, uh, captain. General. General? No, not General. Captain. No. Captain, yeah, right? He's, a, he's an officer. Lieutenant or officer. Yeah. Officer, yeah. Membrane. And uh, in in 2000, when uh, Barak uh, withdrew from southern Lebanon, there was a whole story. Anyway, listen to the last episode, but Jonathan <laughs> now is... Now it's the anniversary. Yeah, actually, two days yeah. ago. Yeah. It was the anniversary. So, but I have to withdrawal. ask about Christian Arabs here in Israel, uh, because you're from the Maronite community, right? And uh, The Greek Orthodox. The Greek Orthodox. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, but, the, but you're from the Christian <laughs> Arab community. Yeah. And uh, excuse my ignorance, no, but uh, but I have to ask if there's if there, if you see any difference between like the discourse that's happening in the Christian Arab community and the Muslim Arab community. Well, I almost didn't see any Christian Arabs in Israel uh, tweeting or writing about it, not on Facebook or not even you know on the news media or anything about that, because it was focused because of the Temple Mount. It was focused on a Muslim issue, so. In in this matter, for example, on my personal experience, I <clears throat> tend a lot of times not to, you know, get involved in these kind of things because this is, you know, something that is Muslim. And on the other hand, this is something that is Jewish. So I always keep like a step back uh, out of it. And I've seen many of my, my Christian friends did the same as well. Um, except, you know, some, some pro-Israeli activists. There are Christians who really, you know, went out there and spoke at every platform that is possible. Um, but this is this is something that is really interesting. If it was only with Gaza, um, we would definitely hear a more Palestinian lenient side because many of them consider themselves to be Palestinians. But because of what happened uh, internally in Israel with, you know, riots done by Arabs happening in our mixed cities, in Akko, in in, uh, in Haifa. There was a huge protest almost like for a week and a half in Ben Gurion Street. Uh, we had in Yafo here in Tel Aviv. We had in Jerusalem. We had uh, in Lod. That was chaotic. Uh, um, with we had Intifada in yeah, Israel. Definitely. I think uh, a lot of people uh, um, love to make it. Uh, or make it like a, a thing to say that that was like similar to October 2000. But I think it was way more in a higher level even. Um, because I think that the Israeli society have never seen something like that happen within the internal Arab population. Yeah. What I mean, what was different than the Intifada is that all of a sudden, this wasn't maybe as deadly as the Intifada, but there were just swarms of, of uh, uh, Arabs. Mob. No, I, I think I think there is a very important difference. In the Intifada, it was an external threat. Mm -hmm. I mean, when a Palestinian um, suicide bomber who is not, a, you know, an Israeli citizen marches into a mall or a bus, he kills Arabs, um, Christians, Jews, whatever. But in the mixed cities, it's it's internal. It's an internal threat. It's a neighbor against their neighbor. Um, it's not. You know, an ex when there's an external threat, we all, you know, come together and um, push back on it. But now it's it's internal. And I think that we were, you know, maybe a few casualties away from a civil war. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think that when Palestinians uh, from either the West Bank or Gaza uh, come in as terrorists to kill, they're generally you're they're generally are targeting Jews. But you're right in the sense that here it was. The this, the contrast was much more clear because it was mixed cities and it was obviously the Arab community. It was not Palestinians community. against Israelis. Yeah. It was Arabs against Jews. Yeah. Even though what I'm saying is Palestinians no, against Israelis right, right. generally is Palestinians against Jews. Right. Yeah. But, you know, in real life, it doesn't always work this way yeah. when they blow up a bus. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about, I, I got to ask you guys how, how it made you feel to see... Um, uh, basically Israelis living abroad or Jews living abroad, people who sort of are of our nation, right? But be them Israeli or Jew, Jewish, um, uh, talking about Israel and not taking, you know, a stand. So there was, for example, Gal Gadot, which we talked about in the last episode, and uh, Sarah Silverman I recently saw, and uh, Man Mandy Patinkin, and many people putting posts Who the hell is Mandy Patinkin? Mandy Patinkin? <laughs> my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Oh, it's Prepare him. Prepare to uh, die. He's Jewish? Yeah. The guy from... He, that's him. Also Homeland. 
Mandy Patinkin, yeah. Okay. Oh my god. The ginger I, guy? I, I never knew that name. What you know you know the Princess Bride? My name is Inigo Montoya. No, you yeah. You killed my father. Yeah. But who the die. hell knows his name? Yeah. He's a famous actor. <laughs> Mandy Patinkin. And then he played he Aiden played has, Saul. Has posters of him <laughs> <laughs> on the wall. Man, the chairman of my the hero. is he your man crush? One person is. fan club. <laughs> he is because he's such a he's a burly man. I was yeah. Mandy Patinkin. Yeah. Okay, we're sorry. It sounds Mandy. like a Jewish partisan. <laughs> Mandy, you like disappointed me. I'm, I ripped down the poster though. Since I xed out his face with lipstick, it was kind of weird. Anyway, so how how did it make you feel to see that kind of reaction from people who supposedly should be standing up for Israel? Do you want to go first, or I, I think I'll start like with a really short uh, answer um, because you know sometimes one of, one of the things that really bothered me is, for example, with Gal Gadot. You know, everyone knows that she's Israeli. Everyone knows that she she was an IDF uh, um, soldier, but suddenly when it comes to these kind of things, I I would really like to see her take a really you know strong stand for Israel, especially because she has. She has been boycotted from a lot of Arab countries uh, uh, because, you know, her movies were boycotted because she was acting in it. So it's like you don't have any audience to lose anyway. They already like not following you. So this is something that I would really like to see from from famous people around the world. And, and Sarah Silverman, I think her tweet was. I don't know. It's like it's it's a bit mean. It's like leave us the Jews alone. Like just get attack Israel. You know, yeah. this is something that was like okay, wait, you can't exclude yourself from this thing because eventually it's like a um, a worldwide thing that is going on. The anti-Semitism that just has been rising throughout the the last few weeks is is really concerning. Also, fear. Correct me if I'm wrong, but like Gal Gadot, the Palestinians uh, celebrities. They have no problem being 100% with their people, with like the Hadids. I, yeah. But our celebrities are um, yeah. a bunch of... So I, I, I really like how Jonathan phrased it. I would like to see Gal Gadot taking a stand. I think expecting her and shaming her for not taking a stand was a step too far. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think she, you know, she is a proud Israeli. She talks about Israel everywhere she goes. I think shaming her for not putting out a clear statement soon in, like sooner than she did was kind of I no, mean, the problem is the actual I mean, statement. Yeah. No, but but I think that something about it is that Gal Gadot is the best Israeli ambassador out there because she's authentic. And asking her to um just spit out MFA, you know. You don't transcript. think you don't see cowardice in what she did? Because personally, I, I don't think might that that's be. I don't know. I don't know her reasons, but I think that the way she speaks about Israel in other occasions are it's just way more important than issuing a statement two days earlier or, or you know a start. But I agree with Noah. It's not so much the timing of the statement, although the silence was deafening, but. The fact that she basically equated, you know, that that, that she yeah. worries about Jewish lives and Palestinian lives, and taking basically the 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 UN. line of yeah, the UN line. Yeah, no, I I would a hundred percent would like and expect to see something more, you know, out there and something more bold. Um, but I think her actions are way more important than you know a statement. But as a tool. Like you but get what I'm saying? She's not a tool. She's a person, and I think that no, if, but 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 if that's what's going to discredit her, yeah, I rather her not doing that and keep speaking about Israel on other occasions and making her voice heard and be a really great ambassador for Israel on I don't know Conan O'Brien or whatever. You're saying that politically she should it take the more moderate wiser. line so that she can stay out in, in the consensus. limelight. Not just in a limelight as Gal Gadot as an ambassador for Israel. Because right. I think, I think that, this was her moment of, tr right? This was the true I think test that, for her. I, I think that might have, if she did it, I, I don't know. I, I think that it might have um, discredited her in a way that nobody would listen to her anymore when she speaks about Which Israel. Which is why uh, I and think it would have... And she needs politically, like in a strategic way to to choose her battles and it's not like she didn't say anything she did i was also disappointed by her statement but i think that if um that's what's going to prevent her from not being able to speak about israel positively on other occasions it might have been smart um, but i think that something more interesting is not just the celebrities i think that american jews are for the 
at least American Jews our age are for the first time realizing that even if they don't want it to be this way, they are Jews before they are Americans or Europeans. I mean, no matter what they do, no matter if um, they support the Palestinians, no matter if they support Israel, if they define themselves as Zionists or anti-Zionists or just non-Zionists, for their surroundings and for the people around them, they're first of all Jews. They might be citizens of the United States, but they are Jewish citizens of the United States and they cannot run away from it. And I think that's a very important realization. It might be sad for them. For me, you know, it's an important step for them to understand that. Yeah, I agree. I think, though, that this is the tipping point, right? This is like exactly the problem is that many of the right. Jewish Americans are confronted with that dilemma. Either I'm Jewish or I'm, you know, uh, or I'm American. And you can be Jewish, you can say, you can call it Jewish American, but really either you're Jewish or you're American. And many of them are choosing to be American and running away from there. And they can say for now, I'm, uh, you know, attacks on uh, Jews are uh, unforgivable, but, you know, we can criticize Israel. But in the end, it's, it's that choice. And I feel like Gal Gadot's decision was to make that choice of American and not Jewish. But I don't know, you know, we'll see. Let's get back to Temple Mount. So my favorite topic. Yeah. <laughs> so and her favorite there, place to visit. And that's true. Yeah. She's there more often than she goes to the grocery <laughs> shop. Um, Honestly, I think I go there more often than I go to my parents. But OK, they should open a grocery <laughs> shop there. <Yeah. laughs> uh, Temple Mount Express. <laughs> but just like not during Ramadan, because then you can get arrested. Oh, my friend got, no. got arrested for eating a carrot on Ramadan because it provoked the Muslims. And they it's were, a religious symbol. He was, carrots. he was yeah. just, I'm not even kidding you. The report said that he ate the carrot provocatively. And when I read it, I'm like, oh shit, <laughs> this dude is, this dude is, no, we'll yeah, I was like, right I was if like, you follow me on OnlyFans, you'll yeah. find out. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, shit, this dude is religious. Do what do you mean? <laughs> oh, I don't think about it. <laughs> I was like, this dude is religious. What do you mean he ate a carrot provocatively? But it turns out they just like, like the Muslims on the Temple Mount got offended because he ate it on Ramadan. And ah, they were they're fasting. fasting. Yeah. And I was like, dude, that's like Aye. eating provocatively. That's like a so very th- there weird are two expression. Narratives. There are two narratives, right? There's the narrative that says basically that we sent policing because they were rioting and they wanted to provoke us. And there is their narrative, which says they wanted to peacefully pray uh, uh-huh. in their peaceful and loving manner. And we, for some reason, just launched brigades of cops at them as they were praying <laughs> it's, it's, it's <laughs> as they were praying yeah. innocently just to basically it's a good them. story yeah it's a good story you can't blame people for buying it uh so well, they know how to play the narrative they're, they're really winning yeah. they're winning in the public opinion so so like how what really happened um i think if you know anyone who has a twitter Um, account or Instagram or any other platform or watches videos online, um, they can see what happened. I mean, my peaceful prayer does not include throwing Molotov cocktails or rocks. But they Um, threw, I really asked. Yeah, so so I don't know if everyone here remember, but, you know, it started on Jerusalem Day, uh, which is the day that um, Israel unified, reunified Jerusalem. And even before everything started, um, Israel decided not to allow Jews to ascend to the Temple Mount. I was there um, that morning and I was prevented from ascending because they didn't want to provoke the Muslims. Because you're Jewish. Because I'm Jewish. Um, Reminds me of uh, dark times Um, in another continent. so, So it's not like we did something. And even if, you know, obviously Jews would um, ascend to the Temple Mount, that's not a reason to start rioting violently. But, like, Israel even took precautions, saying, you know, we're not going to allow, we're going to restrict Jewish citizens of Israel just to prevent this from escalating. But the night before Jerusalem Day, not knowing that Israel is not going to allow Jews in, um, there were a lot of videos, circul- uh, you know, that were published of uh, Muslims on the Temple Mount um, stalking um rocks and building barracks and and everything so inside the inside inside the mosque inside the mosque on whom i mean they were preparing for 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 the jews to ascend so they can 
obviously throw these things at them and then uh, for the security the Israeli security forces to ascend right. um, and and you know throw so that at claim- them and, and when they saw this is not happening you know uh, Israel decided to not allow Jews on the Temple Mount that day they started throwing these rocks and Molotov cocktails over the um, the wall um, to um, the Ophel Road it's the road circling the can it be done Jerusalem yeah it can um, it's just it's on a platform so you can throw it to the road on the one side and then to the western wall on the other side so they just threw what they had on both directions and this is when uh we saw that um horrifying video of the driver um being ambushed by by a few um oh, that was actually policies. because a rock was being thrown yeah so they started rioting on the road and threw things malt of cocktails and rocks from the temple mount to the road um and the police had to block that road um, Guys, what she's talking about is a video of uh, right at the beginning of this whole mess of a guy who got basically dro- like dro- drove off the road because of a riot of uh, right. Palestinian Arabs. Yeah, and they then tried to open tried his to, door yeah, and, and attack him. They so th- you could to, see them yeah. throwing rocks in. So look it up online. Check out the video because it's just horrifying. But it's important to see. Yeah, so I think and you know anyone who who sees that video and other videos understands what really happened um yeah. the israeli police had no other choice and then there was in. the photo that ayman oda a video yeah. not a video photo that's actually pretty interesting what happened it um it's it's a video or a picture um of jews celebrating at the western wall um jerusalem day obviously uh, and in the background you see a tree burning on the temple mount what the muslims were trying to propagate is that um you know the Israeli police just lit up a tree and like in, in intending to burn the Al Aqsa Mosque. But what actually it's, it's, happened? It gets cold in Jerusalem at night. You yeah, gotta, uh, sure, keep warm. you need to heat yourself. Um, but what actually <coughs> happened is that they were trying to launch, um, you know, explosives and one fireworks, uh, fire, yeah, yeah uh, firecrackers, and one of them hit one of the trees um, because it's heavily for it's not like a forest, but there's many trees on the Temple Mount, and one of them caught fire. Um, the celebration down, you know, at the Western Wall had nothing to do with the tree, obviously. It had to do with the ending of the Jerusalem Day celebration um, that was taking place there. So, okay, yeah, but, the, but then Ayman Ode, uh, yeah. uh, the Arab Israeli member of parliament, took a short video. He cut it, the video before, you know, they started the celebrations and there was no fire up on the Temple Mount. And he just cut it, the video when the fire started, a 15 second of video showing Jews dancing and celebrating while the tree is burning on the Temple Mount. And he wrote only one word. He wrote mezazea, like horrific, in, um, in Hebrew. And it just, the same way that the tree caught fire from the fireworks, this is how the international media, a lot of... Uh, You know, American uh, uh, congressmen and women just retweeted it. It got like 14 million views in 24 hours. What an apartheid, right? We we live in where an Arab member of Knesset by the way today the remark like that. Such an apartheid. French foreign minister said uh, something about that. I said that um, Israel is on its way to become an apartheid, or it might become an apartheid. So. Um, French. It's it's really funny yeah. to see that although they blame us today of being an apartheid, they keep on saying this is the step that will make Israel an apartheid. It's like every time, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, like okay, the death so of this democracy side, yeah. Israel. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah, it's, so it's should, been for thirty years. So okay, I'm putting out feelers. Should we or should we not just take back the Temple Mount mm. from the Waqf? Well, my unequivocal answer is yes. Um, but I don't know. Like tomorrow. Um, yeah, I think the WACF went a few steps too far. Many people don't know what's the WACF. So, so the WACF can... is um, an Islamic body, in this case, a Jordanian one. Um, after 1967, um, when Israel decided that, you know, they want Jordan to take part running the, the Temple Mount compound, um, the, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan established the, the Muslim Waqf, and they are in charge of administering uh, the Temple Mount in terms of the prayers, um, they answer everything to the king but security. Of... Yeah, they answer yeah. to the King of Jordan, and they are in charge of everything but security. But today, 
I got to the absurd situation where, you know, um, for those of you who can watch us now, um, I will just do it the gesture with my hand when when a wakf official first of all they always uh walk with the jewish group um taking pictures videos uh, observing what we're doing but when they spot god a forbid Jew, someone uh, right that's exactly nervous. the Raise thing. Their, uh, like, yeah so when they see or even someone, moves his lips right when they see <laughs> someone moves moving uh, their lips or um just moving around or praying god forbid they do something like that with their finger and then an Israeli police officer runs to that um, poor Jew and arrests them. Off with um, his head. And, and <laughs> I, yeah, exactly that. Like the next step, um, season of the crown, just yeah, exactly. like the Jordanian version. Um, and, and I think, you know, we need to understand that. I, I understand that we cannot um, just eliminate a walk from the Temple Mount. It's a part of the peace agreements with Jordan and, and, I'm not, you know, a hothead. I, I understand that the, the peace agreement with Jordan is an important um, strategic interest of Israel. But I think that we ex- we let them extend their authority over the Temple Mount way more than the agreement stipulates. And now they, they're acting ridiculously and we just allow it. And yes, if tomorrow morning um, I could make the decision, yeah, we would definitely take back way more control than we do. Even if right it means now. war, death... I mean, destruction yeah. and apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, Not necessarily exactly. in that order. <laughs> Setting the Middle East on fire. But, but now talking seriously, I mean, people talk about the holy status quo. They're saying, you know, there's a status quo and it should be maintained. Um, since the status quo um, was established, three new mosques have been built on the Temple Mount. That's not a status quo. I'm sorry. The status quo applies only to Jews. And even then, um, it's not really a status quo because the terms are worsening. More than 30 years ago, my parents um, got married on the Temple Mount. Two years ago, um, two friends of mine did that and they spent six hours in the police station. So in terms of the Jews, the status quo is regressing. It only gets worse and more restrictive. While um, for Muslims, you know, there's not really a status quo. Yeah, there's like six entrances for right, for six. other yeah for yeah. for Muslim prayers, and there's only one entrance for for Jewish or for like A- anyone not people like me. Yeah, like can I go to the non-Muslim the, to the Muslim areas and, and no. enter? No, uh, unless they think you're Muslim. Mm-hmm. And with and the cross on your yeah neck. Yeah. Well, I can be like part of Hamas or something. You can dress yeah. up. You yeah. have to carry. You bring in a rock. Not with this they'll shirt. let you in. Carry a rock. They'll let you in. <laughs> Season four of Fauda. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, Wait. So I mean, I can pass. I couldn't, but you yeah. can. They all. They also only let, uh, from what I understand, fifty at a time, and only during very specific um, hours. For Jews, Jews, twenty. Twenty at a time. Twenty at a time. Wow. And now they. There was a huge <sighs> period of time where Jews couldn't go. Right. For twenty the, days. Um, during the escalation and even before that. So there's a little war. First thing you do. I mean, it's not just even a little the war. It's it's every time there's a, a Muslim holiday, they restrict mm-hmm. us. And the government of Jordan issued an official statement saying that the last 10 days of the Ramadan are sensitive and it insults the Muslims to see Jews on the Temple Mount in the last 10 days of the Ramadan. So even before the escalation occurred, um, Jews could not enter the Temple Mount because last 10 days of Ramadan. And apparently the king of Jordan um, makes the rules in Israel frustrating but uh, i want to hear what jonathan yeah jonathan <laughs> what do you think well um <laughs> I, I i really agree with uh, with ophir i think it's it's really important to keep you know the peace agreements with jordan because this is you know really crucial to, to our status quo in the middle east in general but i do believe that israel needs to take back a little bit of its uh, of its holding in the temple mount and you know, eventually this is a place of prayer. And, uh, you know, the, even us, our, our, you know, the, the Bible says that my home is for all people to come and pray in. So this is something that needs to be sacred. And it, it is sacred to all religions. So I think that it be it should be implied as well to the Temple Mount. This is about time that, you know, we will be able to see Jews praying on the Temple Mount. And we will be able to see Muslims praying in the mosques on the Temple Mount. And I, I really want, as a Christian, because this is part of my heritage, 
you know, eventually when we go back to history, I'm part of, of the Jewish people, whether you agree with it or not. But this is part of my history. This is something that I'm, I'm taught about. We just celebrated uh, Easter uh, a month and a half ago. And one of the main issues of Easter is Jesus going on the Temple Mount and, and you know, praying there and being there as well. So this is something that is, is really part of me. And I would like to be free um, as an Israeli Christian to travel there and be able to pray there no matter what and not be afraid that I might be arrested by the Israeli police. It's so shameful that under our watch this is happening. Like it's the, all, I feel it's all Moshe Dayan's fault, right? That's true. Who is that's your true. relative? I feel like it's my calling right now. <laughs> like, yeah, I have he's to like, fix the mistakes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he's like the cousin of your grandfather. grandfather. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> because you're shaming her. Shame. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's literally that. No, because because just to explain, when we conquered in '67, so he, he said w- we don't need that Vatican. Yeah, mm. so he was the architect so, yeah. of those agreements with the WAP. But we, I, we can get so much money though. It's such a tourist attraction. I know. He wasn't thinking ahead. Not thinking. <laughs> he wasn't ahead. thinking like a Jew. You gotta <laughs> look at it three dimensionally. <laughs> well, he only uh, wanna. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you thank there. you. Um, so there are two issues we gotta. You gotta uh, play the sound, man. We yeah. have sound ah. effects. Ooh, wow. uh, I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, there are two things yeah. we have to talk about. So first of all, Gaza. What the hell do we do with Gaza? I can tell you. Hey, can I just tell the story again, or what story? Or what you wrote me on the first on. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> so the first time rockets uh, were th- uh, shot at Tel Aviv. So we were, I'm running to the shelter. I go out of the shelter. There's no reception. And I see a WhatsApp from Eitan. And he writes me, we should raise Gaza to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this that was is 3 a.m. me. Even, <laughs> yeah. even like the okay, most leftist now, person in Tel Aviv would say that. Yeah. <laughs> and what no. does um, quarter what is to 8 me? p.m. use? Then it's probably not strategically <laughs> smart, but I have, I have zero moral qualms with it. Okay. I, I I just don't understand our. Uh, no, you want to get you. You don't say we just do it. You say we give a warning. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Just no, actually, it... Noor had a great idea, which I think no, it's not my idea. It's a famous it's idea from the past. Fa- ah, yes. Yeah, but you well, can... well, he shared it with me that uh, we should set up an automatic system where any place a rocket is launched from, we we raise a kilometer squared to the ground with a two-hour warning. Get out of the this area, and and then just. Turn on the system, and they will destroy their themselves. They will literally destroy themselves. I mean, well, they are doing it now because more than four hundred of the rockets that were targeted to Israel fell well, inside of, of, yeah. of the Gaza Strip, harming children, women, and, and, yeah. and kids. I just, but to explain my my comment, I really think that Israel is. I I know that we are we are extremely intelligent, but sometimes we're too smart for our own good. So we're very strategic. We should be more like the Americans and bomb the effing hell out of people who attack us. Like, just make them think twice before the next time. I, I, I mean, maybe so you I'm don't buy the narrative that they don't care for your, for their citizens' lives. The who? The Hamas. Hamas. Ah, the Hamas. No, I think ah that they don't know. I don't think that they don't care at all. I agree. I think if we if we flatten a quarter of Gaza, the next time they shoot one rocket at Sderot they'll think twice before shooting another one. I mean, I, I feel like today we saw Sinwar, the leader of Gaza, the Hamas in Gaza, um, he gave a speech today, the first time after the ceasefire. And if, you know, anyone in Israel had the illusion that we won, <laughs> they should just listen to, to Sinwar. And they should listen to Nasrallah, who um, choked up last night. But, but both of them you know, raised their heads out of their bunkers and gave a victory statement. Um, Doesn't mean we, they won, though, or that the, we lost. Sinoir literally said, they know where I live. I'm going there right now. Let's see what they got. And he's still alive. And it was like two hours ago. So uh, I kind of feel like he's not afraid to say or do whatever he wants. And we are afraid to say or do whatever we want. Um, I think um, the Biden administration, I know that might be a bit controversial in this table, but I think the Biden administration showed that they do support Israel and they do support Israel's right to defend itself. And they did give us much credit um, and 
we could extend the fighting more than it would have been expected. Um, I'm not sure it was because they support Israel. I think it might have been a game he's playing with Iran. I, I don't care if it's because of... For I, I wanted to say that earlier when Jonathan made the comment about the UAE. In the end of the day, the reason people in the UAE don't care or support when we bomb Hamas is not out of Zionism or love for Israel. It's because of common interests. And if the Biden administration has common interest with Israel and that's the reason they support what we do in Gaza, I could care less. I mean, I don't care the reason. In the end of the day, what happens, what matters is what happens on the ground. Um, and, and I think that First of all, it was a good development to see that the Biden administration got her back. Um, I don't, again, I don't care if it's because of interest or love. Um, and but, but I do think we need to be worried because we saw Biden being pressured by his own party. And that's the but most what, dangerous kind of pressure. What would you do with Gaza if that's you were the prime minister now? That's a very tough question. Um, I think that there are some mistakes that are irreversible. I think the disengagement, the so-called disengagement from Gaza, um, kicking out every last Jew on the Gaza Strip, including graves, um, was a grave mistake. Um, but I'm not sure that we have any way to fix it right now. I think that the only way to ensure that you know we end Hamas in Gaza is to con- reconquer Gaza. And I'm not sure that we are willing, able, or can bear um, the consequences of doing that right now in terms of how many people are going to die, soldiers, um, and and the international pressure. Um, Obviously, that would have been ideal, but um, I'm just not sure we can practically do that. Jonathan? Yeah, I want to make a remark about the U.S., um, of what Ophir said. I think one of, of the main issues is that Camilla Harris the vice president of the United States have never issued an, an, a statement about the situation. Um, or, or even previously, like we don't know even what's her stand about that, or what's her stand about Hamas, what's her stand on the, the, the operations going on between Israel and, and the Gaza Strip. And this is something that is really concerning. Um, More concerning that she did issue a statement with the boycott APAC campaign. So yeah. it's not like she doesn't care about Israel. So yeah, this is this is something that that we really need to focus on, you know. They don't like us, Biden's those people. So <laughs> you know, what's their what? Why are we pandering to uh, them like we're you know some uh, needy you know uh, friend zoned person? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like why? Why force suck of up habit. to them? I think it's a force of habit. I mean. We, we needed them to that point in the past, not so long ago. And I think we, we still do need them. We like still do the, need the them, 100%. The U.S. is our biggest allies, and no, I don't no, no, think no, that 100%. we can afford to lose them. Aiton is... No, not. I think that's just... It, I think it's a, it's a... You never come to a negotiating table and say, I need you, right? If it's whether you're trying unless to find a Bennett. job... <laughs> unless you Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. No, but you never come to a negotiating table like that. It's just a bad place to start from. And and I don't think you come. You should come to a negotiating table with a lie. So I think you should really internalize yeah, but the idea that we don't need them. The power imbalance is so we, big we, that, we, like, we manage there's without no them. way to deny it. We manage without them until, what, 73? We mm-hmm. managed without Barely. them. We won. We, we, arguably, we did way better without them. <laughs> Up until '73, we won that specific war. We started losing, <laughs> and we went downhill. Like, but Jonathan, we'll you know fine. the uh, Arabs' like mentality more than anyone else here on well, the table. Well, some people say differently. They they say that I'm too much of a Ashkenazi. Of Ashkenazi. <laughs> no, that as but, well. but you you know you speak the language. You grew up with the the culture. So. How do you see the Gaza situation? Like, do you think, like what Ethan said, that if we annihilated uh, a quarter of Gaza, it would change their perspective? I think, I do think that eventually today, a lot of, of countries, even, you know, Arab, like legitimate Arab countries that are more civilized and more advanced in, you know, in technology and, and wanting to embrace more of the Western culture and and, uh, and hug, 
are less tolerant to um, to to innocent casualties during wars, um, because they you know publishing uh, against Hamas, they did have some concerns about the number of casualties rising in in the Gaza Strip, but I do think that they respect uh, 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 strength, and Israel is one of the biggest. Uh, you know, Matsamot, the, the biggest uh, um, superpowers superpowers in the Middle East. And I do think that they see, you know, Fear said it, it's like a, a common interest that they do want to be allied with the strongest. And eventually, one of the, the, the biggest hashtags that is going on in the Gulf, and I will, I will explain it why in a second, is that, you know, uh, Palestine mish uh, Palestine is not my issue. Mm. This is something that has been going on for the last two years in uh, uh, all over the Middle East, because eventually these Arab countries, the majority of them have funded Gaza, funded the West Bank uh, uh, and uh, Mahmoud Abbas for a really long time. But they have never got their respect back because once, you know, the UAE signed a peace agreement with Israel, suddenly uh, they burned the UAE flags in in uh, in, um, in Jidir, in Samaria, in Gaza, um, in on the Temple Mount. Yeah, in Palestinian uh, uh, refugee camps all across the Arab uh, world. And eventually, a few days ago, I think it was Sinwa, he went on TV and thanked Iran for funding and helping uh, uh, Hamas, although the majority of the money was from the Gulf countries and from Arab countries. So suddenly they, they kind of tweeted and, and replied on his comment, well, go look for the, another sponsor because we're not going to continue with that. Mm. Uh, so that was another thing that is really but bothering. you're pushing Hamas and to the corner even more. Yeah, I think and once they'll retaliate, they close, and then what do you do? I don't think they're going to retaliate because eventually, I do think and believe that Hamas cares a little bit for his people. That we we saw that by their response once Israel hit, you know, uh, um, huge buildings that are residential buildings or offices of of uh, um, of you know. Of places and companies, and I do think that they 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 are afraid now more of their own public opinion. Um, but one of I think our major problems is that that we're not targeting that public opinion in the Gaza Strip. But did you hear the why that actually I, I heard an interesting interpretation. It was from a an army general that why they uh, specifically targeted those high rises. Because those are actually the, I mean, where, who lives in the high rises in Gaza, right? Yeah. They're uh, high society. High society, which are usually Hamas elites, officials, uh, army officers, right? So they live in some of the some of the actual targets. So they took out these buildings, and that, it's not that they care about you know their civilian population. It's that hey, you're taking out my penthouse suite <laughs> and the Pokemon card collection. Ceasefire. Yeah. Yeah. So. And I just want to—I just want to uh, caveat that I don't think we should just in a, like di- indiscriminately kill civilians. I don't want to st- stoop to Hamas's level, but I'm saying that we should one stop doing the ridiculous practice of two hours, giving them two hours to get out of a building, and then we don't end up killing the guy. Like, stop it! They—they're in a building. I'm sorry, guys. Take it down. Well, I think this is one of the things that we can, you know, you know, say to the IDF. Well. On, on, on the huge operation that they did on one of the nights in Gaza where they took down the terror tunnels. You know, that people say that it's the, the Hamas metro. I, I, I hate that word because I, it makes it too much beautiful. Oh, yeah, Hamas did a metro. No, no it's I think, terror I think tunnels. It, yeah. No, 100%. <laughs> I think also when, you know, Americans or Europeans hear metro exactly. they think something very different yeah, yeah. they might think gaza the actually has a yeah. right? they definitely think <laughs> yeah, yeah come on 100 <laughs> well, yeah. i've met I, like, i've met a student took on the gaza subway <laughs> <laughs> I've met, no you're making fun of it but it's actually happened i met a student in in houston university a few years ago during the israeli apartheid week the so-called apartheid week <laughs> and um and she she was telling her personal story on how the idf uh, um, was aiming uh, um, an M forty seven. I don't know thirty six. Like the we don't ha- we, the, a weapon that <laughs> the IDF oh, okay. doesn't own. You know, the, it's owned, but not by the IDF. And she said that she was going out of the Ramallah Metro, 
uh, uh, to and then the IDF uh, soldier stood there and and aimed at her. I'm like flame Wait, what? Like huh? what, what metro d- is there in Ramallah? I'm like yeah. are you are you kidding? I was I just descending quick. with my yeah. zeppelin, and this is like a personal experience. I'm like okay, I think you took a mushroom or something, guys. It took it's taken like Tel Aviv like 20 years, and we still yeah. don't have a metro. <laughs> we have a lot of rats, but not a metro. Yeah, no yeah. metro. Yeah. No metro. Yeah. Okay, and then there's the most, I think, hurtful issue, which is Israeli Ar- Arabs, Israeli Palestinians, Israeli Arabs. Yeah. Guys, I, I don't think even most Israelis realize what happened here because so much was hidden by the media, right? Uh, you know, uh, me and Ophir were doing Twitter spaces and this guy who lives in the Galilee came up and started to tell what happened in the villages in the Galilee, like how they were... Uh, under stoning uh, an, an ambulance. Uh, yeah, they like you. But if you live in a Jewish uh, village in Galilee, uh, you you were you were in a curfew. You were in a uh, in a siege, yeah. basically by Arab mobs, and uh, it happened the same in the Negev Desert. So, uh, like I would say, I don't know, m- like at least fifty percent of I- Israel was under some kind of a terror. Uh, activity and how, how how do we move on from that like uh, oh fear you want to start i think we don't i think we don't move on from that i think it would be extremely hard to if if, if even possible to I, I know it's a depressing note to end <laughs> to end the podcast on but i i really am not sure that's possible i mean i think that we missed an undercurrent you know it's just I, I don't i think we the jewish society or we the leadership or we whatever fail to see how many um israeli arabs resent israel and how much they are resented and how far they're willing to go to demonstrate their resentment towards israel um, but what do you say to those who say that it was just a few thousand people so most- i i you know i say that if i was um a resident of Lod and while I was going to the supermarket my next door neighbor walked into my house and vandalized it I would not want to live next to that person again and I would not um, so quickly go back to ask him for a cup of sugar if I needed it for my cake um, and it's 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 a small things like I don't see how we can so easily go back to living together in the end of the day these issues are not a matter of strategy they're not a matter of political decisions they're uh, they're a matter of everyday life and i find it really hard to believe that the people on the ground can so easily go back to normal and to to work and you know meet and hang out with each other but uh, jonathan you grew up there. in haifa jonathan with yeah i want to be more optimistic maybe, okay good to like finish <laughs> to finish like with a more and optimistic listen to him because he lives there no, no, <laughs> I, no I, I i was um i was like seconds away from being closed in this like huge turnout that happened in in ben Gurion street in haifa like i really like ran away to my car mm-hmm. i spoke with a friend that was with me we spoke in english because i didn't want you know not to speak in hebrew not to speak in arabic like i didn't want the guy anything a, of a that. jew was lynched in haifa yeah yeah he's be- uh, very badly wounded in aqua as well he's uh, Aqua, I, yes. like a, only like a week after he just opened his eyes in the hospital mm-hmm. thank god and hopefully his situation will be better um but this is this is something that I was like really afraid of like okay oh my god what what do I have to do like I need to get to my car I was parked like behind uh, a restaurant there <laughs> but suddenly like a, a like Arab mobsters starting shooting fireworks towards the police that were standing on the opposite side of the road and I was like okay I will take the like, the the back road but suddenly they were all running to the back road <laughs> because they were running away from the police and I was like okay this is now coming like they were running oh, shit. towards me. And I was like, oh my God, what do you do? And like they were all wearing black, covering their faces. They were all like kids. It's like they're, they're like 16, 17, 18. That was like, I've never seen something like that in Israel. Not in protests, not in, 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 uh, in riots, nothing nothing like yeah. that. And um, and then like I, I, I ran away from there and I was stuck three <laughs> For four days in Nahariya because the road between Akko and Haifa was closed uh, because of the rockets, the, the rockets, the riots that were happening in Akko. But 
on a different note, I would really like to to um, to be more optimistic, because eventually, when we see uh, uh, deep uh, uh, surveys done in the Arab street, we see that about seventy percent of them say that they are considering themselves of like uh, half Israelis or Israelis in general, and I think that once we're gonna see like the the deep surveys that will be done like in uh, maybe the following year we would see maybe a little bit of 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 like a lower number but we will see it more than 50 percent and this is what keeps me optimistic because i do believe that i've met many arabs that were super afraid to uh to have any any opinion on that they were you know seeing their their jewish friends being targeted so they helped them behind the stages but they weren't able to go and publish them because they were afraid of this you know small amount of 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 extremists that were targeting them um and that's what keeps me more more optimistic, optimistic of this i know that it's the majority that is a silent majority that are still afraid to speak out and this is why we need to push it from our side this is something that now the arab community in israel needs to take focus on and i'm really happy to see isawi fridge this is the the only ever uh, <laughs> positive thing that i will i will say on isawi fridge from merit's party because i do believe that he ran from from uh, um news station to the different news station to say guys you need to relax to so the arab audience he said we need to relax Violence is not the option. Violence is not, you know, the solution. And um, also Mansour also, Abbas. Yeah, exactly. I was I was leading to that. Also, also Mansour Abbas that have uh, um, made huge change in the Arab street in the last elections by saying that he's willing to enter a coalition to a- any coalition. And he was kind of validated. That's what you say. Yeah. He was like validated fr- with, with Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, that he might be a partner for for a coalition, and he was validated by the left wing, by Yair Lapid, and by other parties as well. If it's you know, uh, uh, I think even Lieberman have, have, didn't say anything against it. And he visited the a burned synagogue in Lod. Yeah, and he said that they will be the one to cover and, and handle it. I'm not you know. Yeah, and I, I, I feel that I'm giving too much for Mansour Abbas because yeah. I oppose his politics. But I do believe this is a change, and this is something that would lead eventually to more voices like this to be risen in the future. So some people, first of all, but the Mansour Abbas thing, some people are a bit wary of it because of the fact that maybe we're giving them now the um, the power, right? Because of the fact that they've been validated by both sides, they've been sort of crowned. It's like all of a sudden, this Arab parties have the ability to crown the king, right? To decide if it's going to be left or right. And anyway, I, we do have to talk just because we're going to get so much backlash and <laughs> and and the trash talk on the comments if we don't mention. Bring it on. Um, the Nakba. S- symmetry. Oh. Ah. And the fact that there was a lynch of an Arab uh, in Batyam, mm-hmm. which was, I, I mean, everybody's seen By the Jews. footage here. By Jews. Everybody's seen the footage uh, here because not on for I don't. It's funny because you find yourself saying things you don't want to say just because of the way the me- the media covers things. I don't, it's not unfortunate that it was covered, but it was covered disproportionately. So everybody here saw the footage. It was awful. It was just awful to see it. But I want to hear your guys' input on, you know, just the fact that aren't Arabs uh, being lynched as well. Well, I think that there is a small extremist Jewish uh, um, mobsters in Israel. Um, but I do believe, and, and you know, you can see on the way that it was covered, and you can see on the way that politicians from, from the far right uh, uh, in Israeli parliament to the far left in the Israeli par- parliament, uh, condemning it and saying that this is not the right way to do it. And it was condemned by the majority of the population in Israel. But I do believe that eventually, not only the lynch, I, I think that this is something that we need to talk about as well, because a lot of people's feeling of how they feel on going on the streets, whether they were Arabs or, 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 or Jewish, that was, that was a huge thing for them. I, I was afraid as well, because that's why like, I, I decided to speak English. 
I didn't know if I need to hide my cross that I, I wear on my neck. I didn't know if I need to hide the cross that I put in on my car because I didn't know if a Muslim mob, like extremist, would, would attack my car or like an extremist Jewish people will attack me for it. So that was like something that I was like stuck in between these two words. Or a Baha'i fanatic. Or <laughs> I've never heard Said of no a Baha'i fanatic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're just mostly good at being killed, not killing. But But eventually yeah. it, it's really important to put things into proportions. Um, we, we did see huge amount of, of Arabs uh, going to the streets. Um, we did see uh, a small, really small amount of Jewish people going to the streets in the target of, of herding Arabs. But we saw a majority of Jewish people just defending their homes and defending their uh, um, their streets, like what happened in Lod. Uh, and I've been following many, many guys in, in Lod and in Akko, you know, while they were going on, they were like tweeting live all the time uh, uh, to explain what is going on right now. And, uh, but I think that it's important for us as well to label and put the feelings out there. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think Muhammad Zabi um, uh, um, is an Israeli Arab uh, uh, activist. And he, he talked about it. I don't want, you know, to, to speak in his, his name, but he talked about this, you know, being uh, uh, a minority inside of a majority. You know, uh, Muhammad re- respects uh, uh, Israel. He see himself. Uh, he see himself as an Israeli. He served in the army. He served in the army, but he said that he was afraid to even in Tel Aviv. He lives in in Florentine. He, he said that he was afraid to go in I Florentine. Feel it's an exagger- he was exaggerating. I think. I don't I think, think so. I, th- I, I. I. In Florentine. I, come on. Come on. Well, there there were. Uh, uh, there were, threats. there were threats of of uh, Kahan threats of, of, of uh, yeah, but yeah. He compa- when he says it, he, he compares himself strolling in Tel Aviv to a Jew strolling in Lod, and it's just not the same. No, he didn't say that. He he he, he said it he said that it's different. He said that you know it's right that this is going on, but we need to take as well the notice that all of us now are hurting uh, in a way that we don't know what is going on and we are frightened for the future. Um, Th- this is like what he labeled it. He labeled yeah. like in, in a different, you know, level. Not comparing. I think it's fair to say that, that as an Arab, you feel like your chances of getting lynched are higher than before. <laughs> I mean, right? You saw you saw a lynch in Batyam. Then you all of a sudden start thinking like, okay, well, it the, the, it might not even be necessarily statistic. I mean, it is statistically accurate because the day before there were zero lynches, and today there was a lynch. So it's all of a sudden like, okay, but. Alongside of that, it's important to put, to point out as as Jonathan is doing the disproportionate, you know, yeah, the the idea that there's the symmetry is is quite absurd. Ophir, the last word is yours. Wow. Optimistic, though it has to be. Optimistic. Oh. Wow, wow, wow. I'm not an optimistic. That's a person. lot. Wait, that's a me, lot of pressure. That's a Talk lot optimistically of about an Arab getting lynched. Okay, how can I will. you do that? I will. <laughs> okay, okay, much. let me turn it around. So. <laughs> Um, it's dark humor. I yeah. just want to say that I agree with a lot of what Jonathan said, and, and I think my optimistic note here is that because uh, Jonathan lives in those areas, he is an Israeli Arab, and he probably knows more about you know the state of mind of Israeli Arabs than I do, um, and for I sure about so. the mi- <laughs> yeah. I, that's my optimism. I really hope so. Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> and about mixed cities than I do because he lived in one. Uh, I lived in one only for one year, so. He is, you know, he has more experience. So if he's optimistic, I think we should all be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nice. So, see how you turned it around? <laughs> yeah, that was I'm good. That you. was good. You're ready for politics. <laughs> uh, Why would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, he had so. to make it pessimistic. Guys, uh, follow Jonathan on your social media. Jonathan, how can they find you? Um, at Jonathan underline ELK. Okay, and the field. Elk. Elk. Jonathan Elk. <laughs> it's the, the half of the El Khori. It's too long, it's too long yeah. for Twitter, and I want people to, to yeah. tag me. You also don't have to explain you know. how to yeah. spell El Khori. A hundred percent. For me, it's simple. It's just Ophir Dayan 94. Ophir with an F. Yeah, Ophir with an F. Okay. People are right with a PH. Like, what's wrong with you? Yeah, people? you should really. be hospitalized. Um, 100%. It's like Noah without Vav. Yeah. Like, what's and, happening? Uh, Oh, we Nothing. did it. Nothing at all. <laughs> Nothing at all. Um, and Jonathan, you <laughs> I have... Know, it happened last time you... as well. <laughs> Oops. Oops. 
Yeah, got to fix well, that. My it's especially is stupid because the other Ophir is all over the place that, 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 that Noah wrote or with an F, and I'm like, mm, no, I'm gonna add one with a PH. Jonathan <laughs> is now publishing uh, articles and uh, studies for the Moshe Dayan Center in Tel Aviv University. That's right. That's true. So yeah. you can go. Uh, how, how can they read your first? Uh, Piece? Well, on uh, on Moshe Dayan uh, Center, there is mm-hmm. a link for uh, for articles, analysts, and uh, and uh, and publishing. So it's gonna be there because it's the first. It was just published a few hours ago. Amazing! And apparently, you're gonna be a reality TV star soon. What? No, an yeah. upcoming TV show. Yes. Where? <laughs> you told us. You're shooting this TV, this real... <laughs> ah, real... Ah, it's a... <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's like a three-minute... Uh, it's a four episodes. Yeah, it's like four episodes um, with an organization that I worked with, Reservists on Duty. They are doing this project, you know, to show uh, traveling Israel and to show different types of Israelis. So I was chosen <laughs> <laughs> to star in, in these four episodes as, as one of, uh, you know, as myself. And, um, and reality uh, TV yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice so it'll, it'll be in the air you know when um, I few months? hope uh, yeah, yeah like a month okay. month and a half it's you'll like publish three. it on your Twitter of course so, yeah. yeah okay guys thank you so much for coming thank you for having us again yeah um, before we go really yes. lovely before we go guys we are sponsored by The Forward uh, Forward is a great source of news opinion all through a Jewish lens yes I was just about to read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Check them out, guys, at forward.com. Uh, you can also get an exclusive offer for yes. 2NJB listeners at forward.com slash partner offer and use the promo code 2NJB. You get six months for like 15 bucks. Yes. If you're a real Jew. Highly you'll recommend go. I use too many anti-Semitic uh, tropes. Uh, yeah. tropes. Um, but also, Arutz Sheva, guys, go to IsraelNationalNews.com and check out Arutz Sheva's content. Highly recommended content in yes. English about Israel. And last but not least, IsraelNationalNews.com. IsraelNationalNews.com. And uh, AJN, because we're global, so we're also in Australia, nice. guys. We're on three wow. out of Australia. seven continents. Yes. So the Australian Jewish News. Australian so Jewish when news. are we going to Sydney? Uh, oh, that, one one, once they buy us all tickets, we'll talk to them. We'll even talk to our yeah, people over there. We can go to a show well, like do... live. Mm. Uh, you know, even Australians. That's optimistic. See? <laughs> yeah, very optimistic. Very optimistic. No. Very optimistic. <laughs> Maybe too much optimistic. <laughs> even, even Australians can go to Sydney right now. Yeah. Can, yeah. can go to Australia. That, that is true. Um, AJN.timesofisrael.com. Check them out. And of course, we do this on our free time. So if you yes. want to help us out, 2NJB.com slash donate. Yes. Definitely take it from them, guys. That's it. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank Peace you. Out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nolan Eitan, for, for having us. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. See you next time.